Namaste and greetings. I, Tripta Behra, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI Web Policy Talk. Today, we are gathered for a distinguished lecture on the topic India's macroeconomic resilience amidst global fragility. Facts, factors, and forecasts by Dr. Deepak Mishra. This deliberation is a part of the State of the Economy hashtag econ dialogue series organized by the IMPRI Center for the Study of Finance and Economics. CSFE. As the chair for the session, we have Professor Rafiq Dosani, Director, Rand Center for Asia Pacific Policy, Senior Economist, Professor of Policy Analysis, Pardee Rand Graduate School, USA. We welcome you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us so early, all the way from Los Angeles. With the permission of the chair, I would like to introduce the gathering. Sir, if I may? Yes, please. Thank you, sir. We are elated to welcome the speaker for today's talk, Dr. Deepak Mishra, Director and Chief Executive, Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations, ECREER, New Delhi. Prior to joining ECREER, he was the practice manager at the World Bank's macroeconomics, trade, and investment global practice responsible for East Asia and Pacific region. Dr. Mishra has held various positions at the World Bank, including the co-director of the World Development Report 2016, Digital Dividends, Country Economist for Ethiopia, Pakistan, Sudan, and Vietnam. His research work has been published in various academic journals, including the Journal of Development Economics, the Journal of International Economics, and the Journal of Agriculture Economics. Deepak Sir has also served as the World Bank's country economist for India, based in New Delhi, working closely with the government of India and with several state governments, including Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Gujarat, Karnataka, Maharashtra, and Punjab. Prior to joining the World Bank, he worked at Tata Motors Federal Reserve Board and the University of Maryland. Born in Odessa, Dr. Mishra received his MA Economics degree from the Delhi School of Economics and PhD in Economics from the University of Maryland. We extend a very warm welcome to you, sir. Today, we are also joined by our esteemed discussants them being Professor Nilanjan Banik, Professor and Program Director, BA Economics and Finance, Mahindra University, Hyderabad. Welcome, sir. We have Dr. Pooja Mishra, Associate Professor and Area Head, Economics, Billa Institute of Management Technology, Greater Noida. Welcome, ma'am. We also have Mr. Arvind Chari, Chief Investment Officer, Quantum Advisors, Mumbai. Welcome, sir. I would now like to invite our chair, Professor Rafiq Dosani, to initiate the deliberation with his opening remarks and to invite our speaker and proceed further. We look forward to learning from the esteemed gathering here today. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Tripta. Uh, good evening, everybody. 
uh, it's a pleasure to be here, a privilege to be invited. And I would uh, say that you're in for a scintillating discussion with an excellent set of speaker and panelists. So to begin, uh, just I'd like to put up a slide and start by saying that, you know, India's uh, economic record for this year will probably be one of the best in the world. And it's a, it's a great performance that's expected uh, after some years of uh, battling COVID and other disruptions. I think one of the challenges for India is, as I'm trying to show in this slide, so what this slide shows is US monthly inflation rates versus the Fed interest rates since 1970. And what you see on the slide is that pretty much right through the Fed has tried to anticipate uh, inflation by keeping interest rates above the inflation rate. So if you look at 1980, when you had the massive interest rate shock, the Fed immediately raised rates above those rates of inflation to keep uh, to bring inflation down under control. The last, since 2020, things have been different. So almost for the first time in 50 years. So what we see now is that the, in, the inflation rate is well above the interest rate. And the interest rate is chasing the inflation rate in an effort to bring it down. So that's why the Fed is so aggressively raising rates at three quarter percentage points each time. And, you know, of course, we don't know what they'll do in the future, but my expectation is that for them, inflation is the number one priority. They will keep on raising interest rates aggressively, regardless of um, what else is going on in the economy, pretty much. I mean, it's not that they're completely insensitive to, to the employment rate and the growth rate, but it's, they recognize interest rates as being the biggest uh, risk to future economic growth. So with that, difference if the interest rates keep going up at three quarter percent each time for another say you know a year or so till inflation comes down to the target three to four percent what will it do to the world economies so with that question posed to you uh, all as the speaker and panelists let me turn over to dr mishra for his presentation welcome dr mishra Thank you, Dr. Afek. Let me start by just uploading my presentation. I don't know if you... Okay, let's go back. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Tripta, for a very generous introduction. Um, um, I've been in India for about a year now. I joined ICRIA in June 20, July 2022. Um, so a lot of my observations are based on you know what I see on the ground, what I've learned as economists. Uh, but I try try to keep the discussion to 20 25 minutes so that we can have in you know, a discussion and more Q and A. A lot of those things can be cleared up during that period. Uh, let me begin by saying that you know the Chinese have a proverb that may you live in an interesting time. Um, and what an interesting time that we all live now. So we are um, in the midst of a war, a real war, and perhaps many proxy wars that are going on, including trade war between the two largest trading nations. Um, we are also still in the midst of a pandemic, uh, which has not gone away in many parts of the world. We are living through unprecedented level of inflation. Uh, there's uh, breakdown in global supply chains. Um, there is simultaneous talk about inflation and recession and stagflation. Uh, and then the bigger issues and long-term structural issues like climate change, disruptive technologies, automation. Uh, so you can't really think of uh, you know, more challenging time for world economy now than ever before. Um, so in that context, um, the title that I've chosen is, you know, is Indian economy, you know, has been it seems to be fairly resilient and is that actually does the fact support it what explains it and how do you see the future going forward uh, so anything that we do nowadays i always go to google to start my search um, so this is um, showing uh, that there is a growing worldwide concern that uh, you know the world is about to get into a recession or a period of high inflation or both and it's best captured through this simple uh, graphics on the Google train. Uh, so what it shows is how many people worldwide are basically you know, searching for the word recession or inflation. 
And, and you, if you look at the first the recession uh, line, which is the blue line, there's a pretty high correlation between what people are searching and what happened to the economy, which is the power of the big data. And we have all these now casting and others using Google search to forecast turning point in the world economy. So you see this big jump in 2008, another big jump in 2020, and now in 2022. So clearly, there's a lot of worry and concerns over recession. Inflation is even more dramatic. Uh, even in 2008-9, there's not so many people you know, searching for the word inflation, what it means and how to protect themselves against it. What we see today is completely unprecedented. And we know because inflation is very unprecedented. So this is what is happening worldwide. And it covers a period from 2004 to 2022, yesterday evening. What's interesting is if you do the same search for India, there's not much happening. Uh, seems like in India, we are not too worried about recession. There's not much worry about inflation. Uh, we were worried in 2008-9. Uh, since then, it has been fairly stable. Um, so this is, of course, unscientific, but just to give you a sense that you know there is something that's happening worldwide, but it doesn't get measured in the same intensity in India. And it seems our policymakers seems to agree with this, you know, unscientific Google trend. Um, so here is a quote from our RBI governor, Mr. Shakti Das, uh, that in an ocean of high turbulence and uncertainty, Indian economy is an island of macroeconomic and financial stability. This is said on August 5, much after we made an announcement about uh, the talk for today, which is very similar title. That India is resilient amidst global instability. So, so clearly there is something that has happened in the Indian economy that we are not seeing the same level of turbulence and fragility that we see in the world. And that's very surprising for the following reason, that historically, when the world sneezes, especially when things go bad in developed world, India tends to catch a cold. And this graph provides evidence for that. Uh, so I, I was glad that uh, Dr. Rafik showed the data from 1970, uh, what is happening in infl inflation and the interest rate spike that you saw in the 70s and uh, 80s. Um, so you see that every time, so India, so this picture shows the difference between the growth rate in India and the world. So the blue line is when India is growing faster than the world. The red line are when India is either growing slower than the world economy or very similar, but there's a growth slowdown in the economy. So 1970s was the period of oil price shock, a high interest rate, and we know that was a terrible time for Indian economy. India was persistently a supplement crisis. In fact, that's the time when ICRIA was created, established, basically to look into this issue. So 70s we know, but if you look at from 1991, pretty much every slowdown in India has coincided with a global economic shock. Um, so the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Iraq war in, 90, Iraq war in 1991, Asian financial crisis in 1997-98, dot-com recession 2001, global financial crisis 2008-9, and the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 and 2021. Every big global shock had a reverberation in the Indian economy. And so if this time we're not seeing it, one would certainly you know, like to ask why. So that's my first uh, uh, part of the presentation, which is the fact, is the Indian economy more resilient than the rest of the world? And I think we all know the answer, but I just want to walk you through some of the data points just to see how strong that fact is. So the first is exchange rate. Um, so this just shows the depreciation of the exchange rate uh, among G20 countries and ASEAN 6, which is the, by ASEAN 6, I mean Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. So these are the big six ASEAN countries, which I think are the faster growing and countries with whom you can compare Indian performance. And then 20 G20 countries, which include the, you know, uh, Germany, Italy, uh, France, and Europe, plus the rest of the Europe, and 10 developing G20 economy, including India. So if you put all of them and see what has been their depreciation of the US dollar in the past 12 months, which precedes the war, so it goes from August to August of last year. This year, you see India in the middle. So India rupee has depreciated, but moderately as compared to the other G20 and ASEAN six countries. And if you look closely, 
The countries which are uh, uh, inside the box, those are also countries with high commodity exposure or big commodity exporter, and especially petroleum and petroleum related exports. So clearly these countries are doing extremely well because the petroleum prices are high. And it's not in Russia, of course, is an exceptional case because they are uh, seeing the reverse capital flight. Everybody, every Russian who had put parked their money outside the country are taking it back into it before they're confiscated by the Western world. So you see a depreciation uh, of uh, appreciation of uh, Russian currency, but the rest are all um, you know, fairly explainable based on their economic fundamentals. And India is not doing terribly bad compared to the rest of the G. And this is a high bar. We are talking about G20 and ASEAN 6. If you compare India performance with the rest of the developing world, India is doing extremely well. So I've deliberately kept the bar high. Uh, what's happening to reserves coverage? So this is till 2021 data. If you look at it, uh, you see at the end of 2021, India had reserves which were about 0 0.82 years of India's import, which is about nine months. Uh, of uh, import cups. So international reserves in India are adequate to cover nine months of import, um, Indian imports, which is fairly robust and adequate, even by the IMF standard, which would say five to six months is more than adequate for any country. And before, you know, you don't need to store so much of reserves because, uh, you know, there's a fiscal loss that, uh, quasi fiscal loss that you're incurring by, you know. So, so in a sense, India is doing fairly well. Again, you look at uh, the slide, India is on the top end in terms of its reserve stock. Inflation. Um, so this picture looks at, it's a scatter plot between inflation pre-pandemic, and I'm taking a very long-term pre-pandemic, which is like a steady state rate from 2000 to 2019, so 20 years, and post-pandemic, just 2022, what's happening in this year. And the line in the middle is the 45 degree line, which basically means that's the line where pre-pandemic and post-pandemic numbers should be equal. That's it. So if you're above the 45 degree line, that means your inflation in 2022 is slightly or more than your steady state inflation rate. So India is very close to 45 degree line. If you're below the line, then you're saying that your inflation 2022 is actually lower than your uh, you know, steady state rate, which is Indonesia and Vietnam, which is you know, surprising, but that's because we, Indonesia had a very high inflation in the early 2000. They're getting out of the East Asian crisis, same was with Vietnam. Uh, so in a sense, that's a aberration that uh, the 2009 uh, to 2019 was very high inflation. But if you look at the rest of the world, I mean, look at UK um, or US, uh, between the pre and post pandemic. So between pre pandemic to post pandemic, the ratio is close to six times. So UK inflation is six times higher in the post pandemic period than pre pandemic period. So these are exceptionally high range. And you would expect in this period that India would have a much higher inflation than what it is, but India is very close to what it was. So India's inflation seems anchored around its pre pandemic expectation. Now, economic growth. Again, India will remain the fastest growing country in G20 if you take the average of 2022-23, compare that to 2000 to 2019. And I've done the exactly the same, you know, growth pre-pandemic, growth post-pandemic, 45 degree line. If you're close to the line and if you're further, closer to the Northeast uh, point, then you're doing better because you're having high growth, both pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. And India actually is doing very well on that. And if you put the inflation and the growth together and compare what was the pre-pandemic to the post-pandemic period, the picture is even more um, uh, remarkable because what you're seeing is you know, all the rich countries uh, in the G20 are moving from the quadrant of low growth and low inflation to low growth and high inflation. So from Southwest to Southeast quadrant. And so you look at UK, Germany, you know, the countries which are very high. China, which was on high growth and uh, low inflation, has now come to low growth and low inflation. India is the only country in that quadrant among the group of 12, which has stayed in that range. And you know, so it hasn't, it has continued to have high growth, but not with higher inflation. So in a sense, India is going into the G20 presidency with a bit of a bragging right that you know we can manage our macroeconomy much better than you guys 
one. So, so in a sense, it's a very nice story to tell. Uh, so the answer is Indian economy has indeed been more resilient than the rest of the world. But then the real question is, you know, what explains it? And is that, you know, how credible are these numbers and how credible is my storyline? So let me quickly spend time providing you a few explanations and telling you which is my favorite explanation. So first possible explanation is that perhaps this is premature. You, we are still in the middle of the crisis. This crisis hasn't unraveled. Um, so let's not get carried away that India is resilient. Things might actually get pretty bad. And as Rafik, uh, Dr. Rafik mentioned, you know, the interest rate in US will continue to rise. So the taper tightening will happen over the next six months, 12 months period. And nobody knows where India will get, you know, end up with. So let's not, you know, declare victory. Uh, and we might well get affected, uh, but maybe with a lag. So let's stay prepared for it. So all those numbers are, you know, um, not very helpful because we are in the middle of the thing. So let's not analyze them take so less from it. That's one possible explanation. The second could be that, uh, that this is not so much of an Indian achievement, but it's more a failure of the developed, uh, developing, it should be developed countries. Uh, that's because as you saw in the graph that uh, Dr. Rafik showed, you know, interest rates were below the inflation rate for a persistently very long period of time. So the, uh, so a lot of the countries went for unprecedented stimulus uh, on the fiscal policy and highly accommodative monetary policy for a very long time. You know, people like Larry Summers and others have been talking about it, you know, at least 12 months or even earlier than that, about the need to start tightening. And none of those things were happening because of, you know, political economy issues and the fact that, you know, the median voter and for the median politician in many of these countries have moved leftward, uh, which is, but what, whatever the outcome is, you know, they have a much higher inflation, the, you know, so that's a problem their own making. So let's not say that this is an Indian achievement, is it's more a developed country's failure. So, but that's a one-time explanation. There could be a third explanation, which is a much deeper explanation that actually the world is rapidly changing the source of global macroeconomic stability is actually changing very rapidly. So think of this, the last four global crises have all originated in the West. So the dot-com crisis, the global finance crisis, you know, the COVID-induced crisis, COVID might have started somewhere, but the economy, you know, and then the what they call the cost of living in, in a crisis in 2020, they all happened uh, from, the developed world and then spread itself through the rest of the developing world. Not just that, if you look at the Brexit, the US-China trade war, the Russia-Ukraine war, um, the protectionist tendencies. So many of the shocks that the global economy has been facing are actually not coming from developing countries, which is unlike, let's say, 1980, when Mexico had a peso bonus crisis, it was Mexico's problem that spiral into the rest of the world. Or the Asian financial crisis, which is a Thailand issue, that had a contagion effect on the rest of the world. We are not seeing so many of that. So is it that this is actually a more structural, deeper explanation that the periphery countries have become stronger and the core has become weaker? So the custodian of the macro stability have given up on the responsibility of holding the world and they are you know, doing stimulus and in the developing world is trying to hold on to the micro. So that's a deeper explanation for it, but was, you know, which is why India is a beneficiary of it, but India hasn't really contributed to that process so much. And then the fourth explanation is some Indian policymakers would say, actually, um, you know, Deepak, you're trying to provide also the experience, but give us some credit that we actually were responsible for turning around this economy and creating this micro stability. We undertook all the supply side reforms when the rest of the world was doing demand side reforms during COVID period. We built infrastructure, we created digitalization, lots of, you know, we are focused on climate change and green technology. And all these things are creating the growth uh, on the supply side and, and starting to kickstart privatization. And so we must deserve some credit for what India is doing, including, you know, um, including uh, reforms on the banking sectors and fiscal 
you know, keeping the fiscal tight and being a little less accommodative uh, than the rest of the world. And I think there's some truth to that. And I'll come to an explanation uh, in, the, in the next slide if I have time. In fact, I'll go, come back during Q&A that one of the reasons why, while India has done all the supply side reforms, India hasn't done equivalent external liberalization that it used to do. So in a sense, we are uh, getting a short-term benefit of the supply side reforms without the inflation because our external liberalization has become weak. We are exporting less. And that's why the domestic economy might superficially look stronger than it otherwise would be. And the final, which would be the more the nationalistic uh, explanation thing, look, I think India has arrived. We are breaking out of the emerging market pack. We are no more a developing country. And like China, we should be considered in a league of own. Uh, and so this is like, you know, that uh, we are here, we are staying, and all these are our achievement. And, um, and we are now, it's a different India. Um, my personal bias would be somewhere between two and four, and we'll come to that uh, during Q&A as to which one makes more sense. And I'm sure there'll be, everybody would have a view on it. This may not be an exhaustive little explanation, but it captures fairly large number of potential explanation for why India economy seems more resilient than the rest of the world. Now, let me, I'll skip this one and come back to this domestic reform versus external liberalization process during Q&A session. But let's go to the third part of the presentation, which is, um, so what does this mean? Um, so, okay, you told us that India on surface, superficially at least, looks very resilient to the rest of the world. There are many explanations. Some explanations favors India's own domestic management and some favors global explanation but there is somewhere truth in between. So we know that, but what does it mean for the future? How is this going to play out going forward? And can India build on this current momentum and create a sustained uh, you know, high growth, low inflation environment going forward? So here, I think um, if you look at the Indian you know, people writing on macroeconomic outlook in performance in India, you'd find three camps. You know, there are the pessimist camp who think India in the medium term is going to you know, grow at five or below because then I'll come to explanation for that. And there's the optimist who think that you know, India is now a different economy. We have done a lot of these important reforms and India is ready to um, surge and grow at 8%. And then there are the realists who would say, yeah, some of the things have happened, but there are a whole host of other problems needs to be tackled. So India would chug along at its historical growth rate of around 6.5% uh, or slightly lower than that. Um, what are the underpinning of this um, scenarios? I think for the optimist, uh, the big story is, look, India got a huge advantage of the post, you know, in the way we handled the COVID, we did not get into strict lockdown, we didn't do zero COVID policy. Uh, thank God there's immunity, you know, Indian achieved immunity because it was not, um, uh, you know, it was more accidental than deliberate. But whatever the reason is, India is well poised to take advantage of the surge in the global economy. So we have, you know, secondly, is our reform credentials have been now strongly established. We did not do massive stimulus and massive amount of populism. And now we are, you know, going to reap the benefit of those patient policy that we took. We are also taking well-positioned leadership role in new economy, which are going to be a big part of the global economy, whether it's about digital technology or uh, climate change uh, induced decarbonization economy. And so we are uh, putting our mind, our effort, our resources, and a lot of our big investors are going in that direction. So we will be in a very good position. And finally, you know, India has uh, relative political stability and continuing policy is something that India did not have in the you know, 1990s uh, or sometimes even in the mid 2000s. Then the pessimist who said, good, you are doing all these wonderful reforms, but frankly, they are pro-business and not pro-market. They're leading to you know, massive concentration in key industries, reducing competition, and competition is the oxygen that creates growth and jobs in the economy. So, you know, all these reforms are not going to give you translate into those high growth fields. The second point that mention is about this crisis in informal economy, that yes, there is top end of the Indian economy might be doing well, 
but the MSMEs, uh, the informal sector, are in pretty terrible shape. We don't even know sometimes how bad they are, and the, you know, the, the joblessness of the economy and other things tells you that this is not a sign or a foundation on which you can build eight to nine percent growth rate. Then there are you know severe critics um, like Arbin Subramaniam or Raghurajan who would also point to the fact of centralization of power, funds and decision making process, weakening of institutions, and the triple challenges of authoritarianism, cronyism, and majoritarianism, which could hobble India's growth prospects going forward. And then finally, in the, the middle uh, story is you know, that obviously there's been some improvement in the post-COVID period, but the fact that we had two years of learning crisis where you know, kids in schools and colleges did not go and you know, got the education, I think there will be a long-term implication on this. So the potential growth may be certainly slow, lower than before. Um, there is strong momentum, but can this be translated to sustained improvement? And then the jury seems to be out on that. And let's not forget that there's still global supply chain problems. India has limited fiscal space. As finance sector has improved, but there are unresolved issues um, at the heart of it, which needs to be tackled. Uh, so, so, so you cannot be so optimistic, but there are good reasons to not to be a pessimist either. So with that, let me uh, sum up, and I want to spend more time you know, listening to the discussion and also answering the Q&A, but I think, um, there's good reason to believe that Mr. Shaktikan Das uh, has indeed been right, that at least based on the experience of the past few months, India seems to an island of macroeconomic and financial stability in an ocean of high turbulence and uncertainty. This can be explained by sound economic management at home and unfortunate turn of global events, sometimes inconsistent and flawed policies by the developed world, and a dollar for good fortune. Uh, but we must know that this is a short-term respite. There's no reason for us to believe that what has happened in the last one year in India is a reflection of permanent shift in the Indian economy and jury is still out on whether India can turn its current positive momentum into sustained medium-term recovery, but there are good reasons to be cautiously optimistic. That's all from my side. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mishra. That was really excellent presentation. Uh, it sounds like you're coming down on the side of between the optimists and the realists. Let's hope that uh, our panelists have a variety of views. So let me first turn over to Mr. Arvind Chari for his views. Uh, thank you, Rafiq. Uh, I have to thank Rafiq and uh, I am PRI Arjun and Simi and team to invite me to be a discussant of uh, being from a market. It's always good to be associated with academics and research. And I have always come away with very different views and very different takes on, you know, how I, how we in the market look at economic data, short term or long term, and how researchers look at it. And uh, I would also hope that from my discussion points, uh, I'll try and give some market in terms of how investors see this concept of resilience, uh, this concept of long-term opportunity that India has. Uh, Professor Mishra, Dr. Mishra, uh, great comments. And I agree with quite a few of that, especially on the, uh, you didn't mention about the fifth part, which was uh, India breaking out. Uh, although there are a lot of uh, ifs and buts, but if I am a foreign global investor and I'm looking to invest over the next 10, 20 years, uh, India is a, in a sweet spot in terms of to be able to receive that, uh, that long-term capital. And if we don't mess up, there is a significant opportunity which will, which will build more resilience. I'll very quickly take you through a short slide presentation. Oh. Can you see this? We can see this. Yes, it's fine. Perfect. So, of course, uh, resilience is both macro and micro. And, you know, uh, I believe one of the reasons we are resilient is that we've done a lot of things. India was called a flailing state. Uh, but here we are uh, 75 years after independence and uh, much to do. But there are significant improvements in soft 
and in hard infrastructure, uh, both from a demographic or quality and skill perspective or health, or in terms of you know just the integration with the global economy and getting the benefits of how global economy uh, goes. And this, uh, and I think as India progresses, at least for the next decade and a half, uh, given the fact that we have demographics, and if you're able to create the jobs for that demography uh, of a very aware, educated, and aspirational Indian who comes about and starts in the workforce and uh, is trying to earn, if you're able to create the mechanism, I think the resiliency will only get built. There are, of course, short-term and long-term resiliences. And uh, we've seen that as India has integrated and opened up and you know there is still a lot of, uh, as, as Dr. Mishra said, liberalization on the external account to be done. Uh, but our ability to fund our uh, macro issues, which is largely comes from oil prices in some sense in the, sh in the short term, uh, keeps getting better as India exports more goods and services and also is able to attract long-term capital into India. So we believe that up to 3% of GDP of current account deficit, India will be able to fund. And when, when the current account will lower, we see the RBI increasing FX reserves in today's monetary world that we have. Uh, there's no option for our emerging market central bank but to build these reserves and, and, and build up the buffer. In the current context, given we are seeing inflation and we are seeing inflation across items, but especially in food, uh, in the developed world, food is a big issue food, food inflation. And in Bihar, we have some vulnerabilities, soybeans, in a bit of uh, pulses, uh, edible oil. Uh, but overall, I think India is in a much better, better situation that if we have domestic uh, rainfall and good reservoir levels, uh, we will be able to manage our food inflation. Uh, there is also a very long-term, uh, you know, journey that India has taken, and we've seen that the reforms that we've started in the late '70s and the early '80s, irrespective of any government that has come, they've they've built on that reform of market economy, uh, you know, deregulation, and we're still not there, but trying to create institutions which create rule of law. And this, I think, uh, this I believe gives a lot of resiliency from a investor sentiment or a, or, a, or a investor was looking for long-term investment. Uh, if there is a path that is laid down uh, and that is followed without too many hiccups in between, uh, there is a certain, there's a some sense of certainty that investors get and you know that that attracts capital. Uh, uh, Dr. Mishra uh, spoke about India being reliant on global GDP and, and global economy and that is very true. Uh, but that it, it matters as to what your what is your expectation of Indian GDP. If your expectation is eight, nine, ten percent, then of course you need a very strong global economy and global GDP to function for India to be able to achieve that. If our expectation is that India can grow at six, six and a half, then despite or in spite of global economy, India has shown that we've been growing. So this this is a chart going back to 1980, and I've broken it up into governments in power. So, you know, the asterisks are coalition governments. Uh, so think about everything that has happened in India since 1980, you know, assassinations, political instability, famines, inflation, low inflation, very high interest rates in the global world, low interest rates in the global world. We've seen all that we had to see. And India's GDP has averaged that six, six and a half percent over the long period of time. And it really has not mattered whether we have a left government or center to left or right to right to center. Uh, most governments have followed a blueprint of reforms and that blueprint of reform has, has continued and it really depends on you know what is priority and also what speed and what political ability you have in the sense that we've also always believed that you know, coalition governments are actually very good for, for a diverse federal state uh, entity like uh, a, a setup like that we have in India. Uh, you know, take the example of, say, nationalization in the in the late 60s or even demonetization now. In a coalition government, I don't think it would have happened. There was opposition and there was there had to, you had to build consensus to drive a decision. Uh, you might not have had uh, such kind of decisions. Of course, it has its own impact on speed and agility of decision making uh, and it can curb down growth. But I think in, everybody should keep in mind that what is the potential GDP that India has and should be aiming at. And that's your realistic expectation of what you'll make out of returns. I'm, I'm putting my investor hat uh, as to what I'll, what I'll achieve. And if if my expectation is six, six and a half, 
then I know that democracy has its plus and minuses. Coalition governments has its plus and minuses. And India will India will be slow and steady. It will not, India is not China. Uh, uh, the, uh, Dr. Mishra made one that point on uh, is India breaking out? And if I am a global investor or if I'm a global multinational corporation and I want to invest tens of billions of dollars over the next 15, 20 years, uh, which is the uh, destination that I'll choose. And we saw in Japan in the 60s, 70s, in Korea in the 80s and 90s, and then in, in China, where as the opportunity, so people saw the opportunity and this, they poured in a lot of money. And this is the chart of China FDI and India FDI and China FBI and India FBI. And that's a long way to go, right? If, if India is that democratic setup, rule of law, reasonably good political stability, should we be able to attract these kind of capital? Maybe not as high as China. Right? Globalization and the global world was very different. There was WTO was working. Today, we don't even talk over WTO. Uh, but still, uh, is, is, it is India's uh, thing to not mess up and ensure that to build more resilience over the next 10, 15, 20 years, India is able to create opportunities and create the setup to be able to attract these large kinds of capital. And the capital is available. Uh, if, you are, if this is the, I just taken from an endowment perspective, uh, investments from asset owners. And if I look at their global wealth, pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and wealthy individuals, they have about $270 trillion in assets. And India public equity plus private equity now, uh, if I add all that, in market value terms, we won't be more than a one one trillion, one one and a half trillion dollars in market value. So we're still less than half a percent of global allocation. And if, so, if I if India is that opportunity and 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 the growth that's going to happen in the next 10, 15 years, uh, if global allocation has to increase to say share of GDP three percent, you know, or going out to four five percent, uh, that is significant amount of capital available there, which can be attracted and. You know, uh, only if you are resilient and if you are showing you have reforms and you have that set of parameters to be able to attract that money. And if you're able to attract that money, uh, you know, you will you will further and uh, you'll keep creating opportunities and capital. And, you know, if I again, from an investor perspective, uh, Indian GDP, Indian economy, Indian markets are still fairly reflective of the underlying uh, economic trends. And you've seen that in the equity markets. You can see that in the fiscal markets as well, where the, the growth that is there and the shape of the economy and the structure of the economy as it changes, it gets reflected in the market opportunity, which has not been the case, say, in China, where growth has happened significantly, but equity investors have, you know, have not commensurately participated. So I'm, I'm taking the resilience part uh, of, of this uh, because I know Pooja and Ilanjan will do a great job of, you know, talking about uh, macro stability and macro resilience. I just wanted to put a hat of the investor in terms of what the investor is seeing and why investors should be able to deploy a lot more capital, given the fact, given the all the, you know, uh, uh, again, what, what all Dr. Uh, Dr. Mishra mentioned in terms of, you know, why India is resilient and what, what are the problems and what could be the opportunities going forward. I'll end my uh, presentation there. And if I have any, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, it was really good. Um, we learned a lot of the market perspective there. So let's turn now to uh, Dr. Priya Mishra for her comments. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rafi. Okay, just give me a minute. I'll just share. I have a little presentation. Yeah, uh, that's visible, I assume, right? Yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, if you ask me, I'm going to talk more in terms of the key macroeconomic indicators based on which uh, uh, my thought is India has been and will be any day much more resilient than the other economies. Uh, first, one or two slides and yeah. If you look at some of these macroeconomic indicators, you know, uh, e-wibble, stole collections, considering that uh, prior to COVID, just prior to COVID, the economy was uh, going through a slight bit of a slowdown. But uh, during COVID, we kind of managed it well, considering the kind of fiscal and monetary stimulus that was given. 
and uh, now at least we are back to more or less pre-COVID levels. So if you look at your e-bills, you look at the toll collections, you look at uh, PMI employment indices, etc. All of these are pretty much pointing towards the fact that India is on a recovery path and moving towards a growth of 7.2% uh, as mentioned by RBI, 7.4% as mentioned by IMF. Uh, some more uh, indicators which you see, uh, the PMI manufacturing, and that, that's pretty important because obviously once manufacturing is uh, back in shape, services are uh, services have again come back, uh, and obviously services the world across had taken quite a toll during the COVID. Now, when I'm talking about fees and PMI manufacturing, a slide later, uh, what I want to link it up to is that uh, credit growth numbers have been looking pretty good. So I'll come back to that uh, uh, in a little while. Uh, if we even talk in terms of, sorry, even talk in terms of some of the RBI survey results which were recently published, uh, consumer confidence index. So while we've not recovered perfectly on the private consumer confidence part, uh, private consumption uh, expenditure, but uh, we are still on an upward trend in comparison to any other economy you might take, US or any other economy. As far as capacity utilization is concerned, uh, there's a good story that's being told there where uh, we had dropped about, if I remember correctly, 67, uh, 60%, somewhere in that range uh, during COVID, and we've recovered to a 75.3% capacity utilization. So the story is looking good because obviously with capacity utilization improving, credit borrowings will start as far as companies are concerned. Business sentiments are back in the positive terrain even service firms, infrastructure companies, et cetera, they all are, have revealed a very positive assessment as far as the Indian economy is concerned. Um, some of the factors which uh, have also been mentioned earlier is, uh, uh, like I mentioned, uh, the high frequency indicator suggests that there is a lesser probability of a slowdown in the economy, in the Indian economy, that is. As far as inflation is concerned, and I'm sure we all would have gone through it uh, probably this morning's news only, uh, Dr. Shakti Kanta Das, what he said was we probably, most probably we've peaked as far as inflation is concerned, and there's a path that's going to be made with in the next year or year and a half, we move back to a 4% inflation targeting. Um, this was already mentioned by Dr. Mishra, adequate foreign exchange reserves. Uh, so this is these are numbers as of August uh, 5th. The latest numbers, if I remember correctly, is somewhere in the range of $570 billion, well to cover at least about nine months of our imports. Oil prices, and uh, obviously, you know, grain or two, the reason why I mentioned oil prices is because a huge part of our import bill is uh, where oil prices take or have taken a toll on that. Now, with oil prices declining, it's going to be a much better story for India, for sure. Uh, I've mentioned this credit growth uh, uh, a little while back. So when I'm talking of credit growth also, the good uh, part is that uh, the credit growth, the two industries picking up. And here we are referring to all. We're referring to MSMEs, medium and large industries. So the manufacturing uh, sector is going to be back in action and that would work very well. Uh, so positives for India, uh, it, I think Dr. Mishra also mentioned the structural reforms. So we've had more of supply side reforms, which in the long term is going to have a larger multiplier effect, which will work very well for us. Uh, as far as supply chain is concerned, uh, one, we've already, there's reshoring of supply chain, there's trend shoring uh, that we've heard. And um, India is pitching itself to be, you know, the China plus one. Uh, so it's going to help us over there too. Uh, as far as retailers, et cetera, are concerned, uh, the prices, they, the ones who have uh, large inventories piled up with them, they bring down their prices, which will go back and help in inflation too. Uh, most importantly, um, as far as services is concerned, we can be seeing green shoots of revival there. So even if I mentioned uh, there is a report uh, of uh, you know the International Economic Resilience Ranking, and if you see rankings as far as India is concerned, it's uh, we are so okay. Sorry, let me. Just... Yeah, as far as these rankings go, in 2020 we were somewhere uh, sixth, and we have improved all along. And in today's days, as far as economic resilience is concerned, uh, we are being ranked second. And uh, like this slide mentions, uh, this is based on five uh, macroeconomic indicators. That's uh, real GDP growth rate, merchandise export growth rate, 
here, yes, this could be a little worrisome, like some of you mentioned, obviously, considering the geopolitical tensions that are there, current account balance, and uh, the gross debt to GDP ratio. So uh, this is pretty much my last uh, slide. Some of the watchouts which we certainly need to keep an eye on is uh, the inflation, the exchange rate. But like Dr. Mishra mentioned, uh, as far as even if our exchange rate has depreciated, we've done much better than uh, so many economies across the world. Uh, uh, trade deficit, yes, this is a watchout because uh, last year there was a very good story that was uh, seen where uh, exports increased jumped right to about to merchandise exports if i remember correctly it crossed about 400 billion dollars so uh, that is one part that we were banking on but yes considering the geopolitical scenario exports and along with geopolitical scenario if there's going to be a recession in the other countries obviously our export demand for our exports is going to go down so uh rising oil import bill and more importantly there's another thing that i would for sure want um, uh, us to go back and look at are the inequality levels so while we might grow at a 7.2% 7.4% but yes the inequality levels is something that uh, pretty much i think the government and uh, uh, regulatory authorities and all of us need to keep an eye on keeping all this in mind uh, pretty much what i would say is that as far as the country is concerned india is concerned we are in a, you know a good story is getting unfolded and Yes, it's turning out to be a better uh, resilient economy in today's day. I'll stop here and I'll hand it back to Professor uh, Rafi. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. Uh, so one more on the ranks of the cautiously optimistic, I see. Let's, let's hear what uh, Professor Banik has to tell us. Over to uh, you, Thank you. Uh everyone in the room. Um, I actually enjoyed listening to Dr. Mishra's presentation. Uh, this is the first time, in fact, I'm listening to his presentation. In fact, when we teach economics, the first thing that we do when we go to the class is to kind of look into the various macroeconomic indicators. And after listening to what uh, Dr. Mishra has presented, the only thing I can say that once I walk to the class, I will be a very happy man because irrespective of the indicators that we teach to the student, uh, be it in terms of growth rate, uh, be it in terms of inflation numbers, be it in terms of exchange rate, foreign exchange rate reserves, all are pointing to uh, the right direction. So India is doing well in, in that way. Uh, now, after... Uh, Going through all the slides, uh, some of the things that, that strike to my mind, and that comes to me as an enthusiast of uh, economics knowledge, is how we are defining this word resilient. Is it only the uh, factors that has to do with the growth, or it has also to do with the factors that has to do with the development? As you know, that development is much more a wider concept as opposed to growth where we are only looking into, uh, let's say, growth rate of GDP. But uh, in a way, Dr. Mishra uh, Puja has actually kind of pointed out uh, in fleeting remarks that uh, income inequality is increasing. So uh, I will start with that. In, in fact, what Arvind also said that over the last few years, you see that uh, uh, in terms of foreign uh, investment, maybe investment has come. But what I'm not sure is what type of investment are we talking about? Because if I look into the FDI data, most part of this investment are happening in the brownfield projects, which is basically saying that um, uh, as opposed to the greenfield, which is basically saying that uh, as opposed to you investing in some or uh, building some new factories, you are actually buying off some of the existing facilities. Right? And such uh, kind of uh, evidence is there, whether you are talking of the pharmaceutical sector, whether you are looking into some of the manufacturing sectors, that is uh, there. Uh, number two point uh, that I wanted to uh, ask, uh, I wish I, I, I would have seen that in Dr. Mishra's presentation, which is that uh, what explained uh, the growth in uh, GDP? Because as an economist, we can always argue because of GST, because of formalization, because of demonetization, we are seeing an increasing trend of uh, the economy uh, going into the formal sector. And therefore, by just by GDP accounting, one would try to see an increase in GDP growth rate that we are seeing, okay? Uh, th uh, that is another point which comes to my mind. The third point which comes to my mind is uh, uh, 
Well, uh, if I look into the uh, FII inflow over the last uh, one and a half year, one would uh, get a sense that rather than be a uh, investor, FIIs are actually pulling out from the Indian stock market. And, and, and uh, except for, I think, uh, last this month, a few days in this month, uh, never it has happened in the history of the Indian stock market that FII were actually continuously selling in our market. So what explains that if India is doing so well? Why is it that they are actually pulling out of our market? Uh, that is another thing which comes to my mind. Uh, another uh, quoting Oxfam report, I was just looking into the report as uh, we are listening through the presentation. I find that the, the biggest problem with respect to India uh, at this point of time has to do with the income inequality because uh, what has happened over the uh, post-COVID, um, thanks to formalization, uh, be it corporate, uh, be it uh, household, the income inequality is on the rise. And therefore, what we see uh, right now in India, uh, almost 80% of the Indian population, their uh, income, per capita income, is actually less than uh, our per capita annual income. You know? So what type of government intervention is necessary? You know, the other, other, other report which has been talked out um, quite wide, widely in popular press has to do with the World Hunger Index. So if we are doing so much of uh, great stuff, why is it that in terms of uh, ranking of countries uh, in the World Hunger Index, I think India is now 101 out of 116 countries uh, that were ranked, you know. So therefore, uh, are we doing enough uh, to make our economy resilient? Because uh, when I think of resilient, I think uh, what comes to my mind uh, as the first instinct is uh, maybe in terms of macroeconomic shock, consumption uh, expenditure cycles, not too much of volatility which is happening. But what has happened over the last few years, uh, in particular post 2011-12, if I'm looking into real consumption expenditure data, although National Sample Survey household data, uh, which was supposed to uh, come onto the table way back in 2016, 17 was not there, but there are enough indication to suggest that if I'm looking into per capita income household data, in particular with reference to the construction sector, there has been a fall. With respect to the agricultural sector, uh, it is more or less same. It has not increased that much. Uh, and, and that brings to the first point that I was raising. That may be one of the reasons why you see so much of income inequality which is happening. And therefore, this resilient that we are talking in terms of the growth numbers, in terms of the growth indicators, are they a good thing or maybe not so good, uh, uh, great thing? The other point Dr. Mishra mentioned that uh, maybe this time because of COVID, the exogenous shock that we see, which has come out from the uh, Asian country, uh, uh, the, 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 some of the economy here um, in India maybe is doing well. But again, I have a question to that, which is uh, if I'm looking uh, in terms of the global innovation index, if we are really doing that well, so, so, someone was mentioning that India uh, can reap the benefit of demographic dividend. But again, in terms of global innovation index, India is, uh, I think, around 50 uh, in, the, in the ranking of all the countries in the world, which is not a great thing to have. And out of 350-odd uh, million population, which still earn their livelihood from the agricultural sector, if I look into the uh, productivity of agricultural sector, uh, most of the agricultural productivity we find is almost half of some of the developed countries. You know. So uh, therefore the question is, uh, again, uh, inflation. Uh, one may, uh, you mentioned about inflation. I think um, the, the inflation data to a certain extent is also kind of uh, muted in the sense that if I look into the weightage of the various components in the CPI, which is a way to measure inflation in India, you will find the weightage of quill and uh, light items, which which includes all this crude and uh, petroleum and product, uh, those weightage are very small. Uh, in fact, the biggest uh, chunk of weight uh, derived from food and beverages. And within food and beverages, you will find a big chunk is coming from uh, fruits and vegetables. Now, uh, I, I heard about this climate change. In fact, one of the reasons that we should be worrying about is the reason for increasing price of all these uh, fruits and vegetable items has more to do with the supply side shock as opposed to the demand side shock. 
which is basically trying to argue the point that why is it that in the month of April, we found that the price of lemon, we found that the price of potato, uh, or for that matter, even as late as June, July, we find the price of tomato going through the roof. That has to do with the big uh, uh, type of uh, climate change. It also has to do with the government policy, because if you're looking into uh, the, the amount of food which is being procured through MSP, the government has actually reduced a part of that, which is a good thing. And because of that, you see that there has been a less amount of wheat uh, production this year. So again, coming, uh, I won't take much time because it's uh, Dr. Mishra's uh, presentation. So I would like to uh, maybe hear from him uh, more about how he is defining the resilient, that the keyword, you know, uh, because to me, um, we have to move beyond the uh, growth factors. We have to uh, move beyond the macroeconomic factors. We have to look into the uh, development type of indicators and in particular, what type of intervention uh, that is required from the government because it's uh, the private sector is not going to intervene much to help out with the development uh, indicators. That will make the Indian economy in a true sense uh, resilient because we have a large market and therefore uh, that is uh, necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Banik. That was excellent. Uh, so I see we, we have now one cautious pessimist, a new category, uh, and three cautious optimists. So let's discuss maybe one, one question or two amongst ourselves, particularly the issues that you have raised, uh, and, and, see, and see if we can throw some light on them. Then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, I think the question I would like to ask uh, is one that Professor Barnick raised towards the end, which is that of climate change. If the climate scientists are correct, you know, we're, we're heading for an, probably an inevitable climate related catastrophe in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, it's estimated that India produces about 3 billion tons of greenhouse gases every year. And the World Bank estimates it's going to cost about $20 a ton to remediate that to acceptable levels. So that's an expenditure of about 60 to $80 billion a year and growing every year. Where is that uh, going to come from, those resources? And how what do you think this will have an impact on, on economic growth over the next decade? Uh, address to all of you. Let me start with Deepak, if he has any thoughts on that. Uh, thank you. Um, can I uh, first respond to some of the questions that uh, Nilanjan made and before I come to climate change? Yeah, yeah go ahead. OK. Yeah, no. So I think those are excellent comments. By even all the thanks to all the discussant uh, for excellent comments. Sometimes complimenting and sometimes providing interesting perspective. So first thing I want to say is, uh, obviously, uh, the way we defined it was the macroeconomic stability of India. Not so in a sense, India could be resilient, but or Indian economy could be resilient, but Indian society could be fragile, and both can coexist. So I'm not going to dispute that. In fact, John Robinson. If I have to paraphrase her, she said, um, everything you said about India, the opposite is also true. Uh, so I think a lot of the things that you mentioned in terms of inequality, um, you know, uh, instability, hunger, um, and other issues, I think they can coexist in the Indian context, given that India is starting at a very low level of GDP per capita income. So we're a poor country and we have a large population. So even the small part of the Indian population catches up quickly to the rest of the world, you could produce a 6% produce a six percent growth rate while the rest of the population is not part of that benefits you know, of the growth process. So, so I, I think uh, the story is obviously more nuanced if you start getting into the deeper of the development issues. I would, uh, I would come to a couple of things. One is, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, the formalization was saying, is the GDP growing because there's more informal, you know, informal sectors are becoming formal. Actually, the way the GDP is estimated, even when we have, we do not necessarily count the informal sector, but when we use proxy. So the informal sector is proxied and captured into the formal, say, into the GDP. So unless there's an argument, so by, by sheer GST or demonetization, you can't see GDP going up. The only way to go is if the informal sector is growing faster or the, the formulation is faster than what they were before, 
then you could see something. But I would be surprised to make that argument that um, that the, it's the formulation of the economy that is leading to G increased GDP uh, because the growth rates you know, of the formal and informal are often the same. And so you've already captured some of those things. It's just a base effect change. So, but I think the, there are um, other reasons for the distress. And I think we can get into those issues. Um, when it comes to you know foreign direct investment or portfolio, you know, one good example is you know, why did foreign investors playing India if things are so good? And I think you know perhaps Arvin could be better uh, you know respond to it. But you know sometimes the studies which actually show that foreign investors sell you know they're they're you know, in some sense optimizing the global portfolio. So sometimes they sell in market where things are good to cover the losses where things are bad. So if Indian market is actually doing well, it might make sense. And even during the Fragile Five in 2013, a lot of the uh, selling happened because Indian market was actually doing better and the more liquid. So you'd sell out of India, not because you are pessimistic on India, but because you're balancing a global portfolio. So sometimes it's a collateral risk, but I think there might be more truth and for us, I can come to it. But I also agree with some of the things that you know, uh, Nilanjan mentioned. So one is on FDI. You know, we so there is a um, there is a disconnect between domestic investors and foreign investors. So clearly, there's a lot of bullishness on in foreign investors, and even by absolute number, FDI has increased. FDI, the share of GDP has also increased, but not so much. But if you look at the domestic investment, despite all the kind of um, talk uh, that we see of the optimism, uh, we don't see domestic investors making massive increase in the investment. In fact, the domestic investment, so we have seen a bit of an improvement on the credit, as uh, Pooja mentioned. But again, you see the large um, you know, the investors are not the ones which are where the credit is increasing, but it's increasing in MSME and you know, medium, which is a good thing. But if you want you know, big growth, then it has to be the large investors pulling their money into it. And we are not yet seeing some of the things. So obviously, if you get beyond macro stability to other issues, story is more nuanced. And you know, you'll have to, but that was not the focus of my presentation because I feel even the macro stability is a unique story for India in the 50 years of or 70 years of India's history. That this is, as I saw, uh, showed you in the chart, every time there is a global crisis, India would actually have a slowdown and sometimes growth falls below the global average, which is very unusual. And this time it's not happening. So there is certainly something going on that we need to better understand uh, this. Then in terms of climate change, you know, uh, Dr. Afik, I must mention that I'm not a big expert on climate change, though several of my colleagues in ICREA work on it. I think, uh, the problems are bigger than the 60 to 80 billion dollar uh, that you cited in terms of um, you know which will be more to adapt to the climate change issue by you know re retrofitting some of the things that are the big source of uh, carbon um, but i would say that you know india um, obviously you know has been, you know Prime Modi and others have talked about this whole climate finance uh, uh, business and the fact that you know which countries haven't really poured the money into this, but I think in India, you know, India's climate finance needs are much larger than what it will get from the rest of the world. So I think India shouldn't be just waiting for you know rich countries to uh, to provide the money. I think uh, you know whether we polluted or not, we are uh, one of the biggest victim of climate um, change, and so I think it's in our interest to take those steps. I think climate change is just not a threat, but it's also an opportunity, as we have seen in China and Vietnam and others, where they've gone into solar, renewable, electric vehicle. And I think India is trying to kind of mimic some of those story, and I hope it will succeed. So it's a it's a, a very important uh, issue, and I think needs a lot more careful uh, discussion from an Indian perspective. But I do feel that the, the pendulum in India has changed from saying this is not a problem that I was part of and I don't want to be part of the solution to now saying, you know, that's not going to help me. Let's be, you know, think about what's in India's interest and what we can do. So that that that's the positive change I've noticed in India in the last few years, and especially after Prime Minister Modi went ahead and made uh, his made his commitment by 2017. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deepak. Your cautious optimism continues, which is nice to see even on climate change. Let me turn over to Puja and Arvind. 
see if they have any comments on uh, either what Deepak has just said or Professor Barnick said any before we open up. Pooja? Okay, so yeah, yeah. What I would also want to add is so uh, while there is a good story that is being unfolded, uh, not that we don't have work to do. We have enough work on our plate, you know, and just to add to that entire list that you mentioned in Anjan, another part where I think we need to go back and focus on is uh, the kind of money that we put into R&D. If we want to really be able to compete with the developed countries, we need to put more into research and development. And I'm not talking of the government alone. I'm also talking of the private industry, right? So we do have a lot of tasks in hand. But uh, I will still remain as the optimistic, the cautious, optimistic person that uh, as far as the country is concerned, we are on a good growth path. Thank you. Arvind? Yeah, so I, I will uh, first answer what Deepak uh, referred to me in terms of the FPI flow. So, if, so you're right, Deepak, actually, India has seen outflows because India has done well. So it's, yeah. And also you understand that between September, October 2020, and September 2021, India got a lot of inflows because China went very massively behind its tech and internet and new economy and investors reallocated their money to India and India did very, very well. Uh, so, you know, part of the outflows that we are seeing is, you know, a huge amount of $30 billion came in and $30 billion had gone out. Different investors would have put, different investors have taken out, but broadly that's that's been the part that India has done relatively outperformed in the emerging market space. And, and the other point is the tyranny of the index, as we call it. Investors, although they might act active, there is the benchmark that they look at. And if India's weight in their portfolio as compared to the benchmark rises, they do not want to be overweight. So they will cut their allocation back to the index weight. How much ever view you have, uh, many active managers will not stray away from the benchmark weight. So, you know, that those are factors, which is why I went back, which is why I was telling about the China industry that, as you said, Deepak, that India people have to start looking at India as a dedicated allocation. If, if you have to deploy large amounts of capital, it should not matter what is India's weight in the MSCI emerging market index or India's weight in the share of that as GDP. If you have to make that leap of faith and investment is always an act of faith, to make that long-term investment in India, as you did in Japan, China, and you know Korea, and and there are, as you see, there are the 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 there are infrastructure abilities that are already there. You know, markets exist, uh, rule of law exists, capital markets are are, are there, and you know, kick, yeah, investors can deploy a reasonable amount of capital. On the FDI uh, part, uh, with, with Nilanjan rightly raised. So we've seen a large amount of FDI, which is categorized as FDI, but are mostly private equity and venture capital. So, you know, there's very little greenfield or even brownfield also. There is some brownfield, but, you know, not as much. And I think it's a function of the corporate cycle where corporates uh, invested in the 2004, 5, 6, 7 to 2012 cycle. And they're still kind of deleveraging in some sense. And as Pooja mentioned, capacity addition is just about increasing. So when I think when it goes to about 75, 80% is when we will see new capacity. And which would mean that, you know, there will there should be FDI. PLI is seems to be a good scheme in terms of incentivizing production and output. We haven't seen large investments. And that, uh, Dr. Mishra, if you, can, if you can answer this question for me, like India's fascination with manufacturing, right? Uh, and we have looks like we still miss the boat on low, low value, high labor intensive manufacturing. It's still not come to India uh, in a large sense. And maybe services is the is is the sector where India should focus on? You know that is that is a segment which will attract and create a lot of job opportunities. So, uh, how do you think about uh, think about those? It will, will be good to know from you. Good, thank also, you. Oh, okay, sorry if I can if I can quickly talk on on the climate change issue also. Uh, if you look at India's share of GDP in PPP terms, was about eight percent, and India's share of carb CO two emissions as a percent of total was about eight percent, but you know, if, if the world really needs to control climate uh, or, you know, deal with the climate change, if, you know, if India is ground zero, if India does not reduce its emissions, given the growth that India will see over the next 20, 30 years, there is no chance that the world will be able to meet that one and a half degrees or two degrees Celsius. And so uh, Indian, uh, the government is awake. I mean, in some, at least they're talking about it. We have the renewable capacity. 
but in terms of capital availability uh, i think there was a, there was an estimate of india needing about 2 and a half trillion dollars over the next 20 30 years to just meet its climate uh, mitigation and 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 transition uh, whereas we get a very small fraction of that right now and so we put out a very simple uh, analogy and note that this the table that i showed you about 270 trillion dollars of global wealth sitting in pensions endowments foundations private wealth and we said if if all of them allocate 1% 1% of their overall wealth into what we call the save the world bucket that's about 2 and a half trillion dollars of capital and then incremental capital over every year and that's the amount of money that that every year that ipcc report kind of suggests in some sense that the world needs 2 and a half trillion dollars of climate financing every year to be able to meet uh, the demand so capital is available you just have to find infrastructure and financing measures and the governance structures to be able to deploy that kind of capital into emerging markets like india nigeria indonesia and china which will which are where your major emissions are going to come from so thank you so arvind you know the number of two and a half trillion is only on converting uh, power generation and heat uh, generation to industry into non into renewable forms or electrification forms. Once you add in adaptation cost, the figure doubles. Like the OECD did an estimate of about seven trillion a year. Yes, correct. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, we'll come back and Deepa will give you a chance to respond to Arvind in a moment. Let's let's take some questions from the audience because of time. Uh, Dikshita Padalkar had her hand up. Do you want to ask your question, Dikshita? Dikshita, you can unmute and ask. Dikshita, are you there? No. So meanwhile, uh, do you want us to read out the questions on the Q&A box? I have it up. Why don't you read it out? Uh, I didn't read out the first one. Uh, if they might not able to join, meanwhile, we will read it out. Dikshita, would you read yeah. them? Yeah. Yes, sir. So firstly, we have a question from Rishay Atreji. They say um, they, they would like to ask about India's 5 trillion economy, as some say we are able to achieve after 2026-27. Related to that, they would also like to ask up to what extent does our PFC, private fixed capital expenditure, and fixed capital formation need to perform? Arvind, I mean, Niran, Nirantan, uh, excuse me, I'm going to ask the uh, keynote. Deepak, would you like to address that one? I think on the $5 trillion economy, the answer is no. There's no way that India gets to $5 trillion by 2026, 20, 27, uh, partly because, you know, rupee is also depreciated. In fact, I feel like uh, setting Indian uh, economy targets in dollar is a bad idea because uh, it's much harder because not only your real growth, the inflation affects it, but also dollar depreciation. And I think 20, 2020 to 23 might be actually very low growth in terms of dollar terms, even if it might be high in nominal. So I think 25 trillion by 2026, 20, 27 is pretty much um, out of uh, contention in my view. I'd like to hear if anybody disagree. Uh, private uh, capital formation, yes. I think I just mentioned that we are not seeing um, the the optimism on the you know kind of rhetoric translating to actual action and large investment by large uh, corporates uh, there is um, i i always feel like whenever i meet private uh, foreign investors they are way more optimistic on indian future than indian investors are it's a dichotomy that we had seen in many emerging markets at some point and you would wonder who is more right and who has better intelligence, the foreign investor or the domestic investor. But yes, we need a significant step up in private capital formation by Indian domestic sector to meet those growth targets. I think there's also a question on disaster risk management, which is a good one, but I don't know much about it to answer. Thank you. Well, any of our other panelists like to comment on that question? Let's move to the next one. Uh, can you read that out? Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Kushagri Keji. Uh, they say that considering the economic disasters happening in the Indian subcontinent, Sri Lanka, Pakistan included, India's resilience stands out. 
in your opinion does these make do these make india more vulnerable to what extent does a crisis in the neighborhood affect india is india in a position to help the countries if yes then how qualitatively or quantitatively thank you uh, professor bani can you talk to me no i think uh, we should be mindful of the fact that some of the states in india in particular haryana rajasthan uh, madhya pradesh andhra pradesh uh, who are actually doling out because there is a lots of discussion happening right now uh, how to distinguish between freebies uh, vis a vis welfare state you know uh, i think uh, as a as a as a policy maker there is uh, a necessity for us to distinguish between the welfare state and what we are suggesting as freebies because the freebies is doing no good in terms of containing the fiscal deficit because uh, an overall debt to gdp ratio you know so uh, in in that way i think uh, I, i i should give some kudos to the government of india um, in terms of the reform they are bringing uh, in terms of taking everything to be market determined as opposed to when it comes to the non merit goods you know like what we have seen in the case of agriculture because of free power and water you see the, all this uh, water uh, intensive crops which are actually draining out the water table in northern part of india uh, that is uh, doing no good to the society and that is also related to the climate change uh the second aspect is of course we are talking about uh it's it's more like a one shot game because uh, the politician uh, and and my favorite example would be within the agricultural sector uh, in spite of repeated studies uh, which have showcased that loan firm loan waiver does not make much sense yeah uh, uh, yet we see whether it is congress bjp or irrespective of party color everyone is voting for firm loan waiver because to them because if you look into the distribution aspect of indian agricultural farmers almost 83% of the agricultural farmers are small and uh, marginal farmers with less than 1.3 hectares of land holding size and within that 83% you have only 15% of the small and marginal farmers who have access to formal loan you know now when we are talking of the farm loan waiver Uh, this big chunk of farmers they don't get the benefit it's only the large farmers uh, or the medium size farmers who are getting the benefit who are actually the vote bank for the government you know the same thing we have uh, seen in terms of the agricultural reforms you know? so these are the things i think uh, the government should be thinking uh, more uh, particularly the state government they should be thinking uh, whether to go ahead with that so maybe dr mishra can add more to what i've said yeah dr mishra talks particularly on the question about uh, what can be uh, is india vulnerable to what's happening in the neighborhood um so um yes i mean uh, india is such a large part of the you know south asian neighborhood that perhaps uh, what happens in india affects the rest of the region more than the vice versa so i feel that the crisis that's uh, unfolding in sri lanka um, you know uh, i think nepal soon and bhutan and pakistan i think many of the neighbors and of course myanmar has also been in some sorts of crisis in the past few months i think these are very tragic but i don't feel this will have dramatic economic impact on india but i think there are significant social and political implications that india should be worried about as well which means it will be in india's interest to be of help um, directly or indirectly i mean directly of course india could provide support to sri lanka which india has been doing but more to rally the rest of the world so in g20 which india will take presidency india could actually make a debt relief for highly indebted developing country priority i think that will send a very strong signal to countries in our neighborhood as well in africa that india stands for them because ultimately you know it's an interdependent world in some way we get adversely affected by crises in other countries so i feel like an indian policy makers are very aware about it they're thinking about it um, but um, the other rivalries that india has with china makes it harder for india to take some of the stance because india and china are on different um, uh sides of the spectrum in some of those debate but i clearly think the regional issues are 
getting pretty bad and they're going to get worse over time. And it's in very much both in India's self-interest and also in selfless interest to help its neighborhood grow and prosper. Thank you. So Deepak, let me push you a bit on this. You know, you said that India will not suffer because of what's happening in the neighborhood. The other countries are fairly small. But what about the other way around? Can India help these countries become stable? If so, how? Yeah, I, I do feel that, I mean, um, India has a significant role to play in something. I mean, think of countries like Bhutan and Nepal, which are so much reliant on, um, on both direct support, but people-to-people -people support, connection, remittances, and other kind of things, official aid, uh, that um, India has a very high degree of freedom in terms of many instruments to influence uh, uh, things in the interest of the, uh, in in favor of the uh, those countries. So so clearly, India, um, you know, so but also at the same time i know that in the in the past india had not taken a very generous position with its neighbors india used to like when there's a trade agreement with sri lanka india would insist on a one to one take rather than being generous and giving a lot more uh, concessional or you know terms and uh, support to sri lanka um, so that but that mindset has changed i think india is growing a little bit more confident in itself and realizing that and if you see, you know, Minister of External Affairs, Mr. Jayashankar, has consistently said that apart from India protecting its own interests, the second most important foreign policy for him is um, regional stability and uh, neighborhood uh, first. Uh, so clearly, India is very aware of it, but I do feel that the politics with Pakistan and China does make it a lot harder. Uh, but also a imperative because they are also your neighbor in the rest are. So it's very important for India to be very deeply engaged in ensuring that there is economic, political, and social stability in its neighborhood. Great, thank you. Excellent answer. All right, in the interest of time, uh, we only have a few minutes. What I'm going to do is read out the two remaining questions and then turn to each of our panelists and speaker who can wrap up for us um, on their comments on the session. So there are two questions. One is, is the recent growth due to a base effect? And the same question asks, what will be the average annual GDP growth for the next 20 years in a realistic way? Right. So one that... question, Tripta, and I also have small question. Oh. Tripta, be quick. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. So if I may ask? Yeah, please, go ahead. Thank you. So a huge number of high net worth individuals have been seen to leave India in the recent years. At the same time, some reports suggest that we produce far more millionaires that may actually lose to migration each year. What would the implication of such an exodus be on the resilience of the Indian economy? Okay, so, so one small question by me also. Yeah, go ahead. If I, yeah, so the Omicron wave have uh, really suffered the China's growth rate. And uh, as the news are coming, the Central Bank of China is uh, uh, not increasing, rather decreasing their rates. How do our panelists see that? Okay, so we have four questions for the panelists to address in whatever they want to of that. One is about the growth being due to a base effect, the projection of growth over the next 20 years. Uh, to a question about uh, high net worth exit, it's not just due to climate change, right? India is becoming a bit hot. And the third, last question was on the Omicron effect of uh, in, on interest rates. So let me let me start with uh, Dr. Puja, and then we'll go to Arvind, Professor Nilanjan, and then Deepak can wrap up first. Okay, so I'll take one of those questions. Uh, the base effect is the high growth rate, uh, which we are currently seeing due to the base effect. The base effect is kind of now waning off, if you ask me. Right, so yes, uh, probably a quarter back of, and uh, quarter or two quarters back, it was the base effect which was coming into action. But we are more or less at uh, COVID level, pre-COVID levels. So that's it's. I wouldn't really say it's the base effect still. Uh, another thing that I would want to add is, so while we've talked of certain reforms, in my perspective, there are a couple of more reforms that uh, probably the government needs to look at. And one being, so we've already talked of. Uh, 
uh, you know, state finances, which pretty much point towards the electricity reforms, uh, I think. We also need to look at judicial reforms to be able to do better. Land, we've already been hearing, land uh, acquisition reform uh, needs to be done. Along with that, administrative reform is another uh, part that I think the government needs to go back and look at if we want to continue with the growth story uh, going forward. Uh, that's pretty much my input. Thank you, Pooja. Arvin? So if, if you look at the way you think about real GDP growth over the long period of time, uh, we I use a very simple metric of India's gross domestic savings. Uh, and so effective, what is put into use physical and financial uh, real estate and you know financial is about 25, 26%. If you add gold and everything else, you push to 30%. And you divide that by the incremental capital output ratio, i -core. So even if the i -core is say five, then with your domestic savings, uh, your potential real GDP growth is about say between five and up and six percent. And if you if India does all the reforms that it is supposed to do and is able to attract two three percentage points of GDP every year of external capital to be able to support that domestic economy, then the potential GDP growth increases. So even if you do not get too much external capital and we are able to maintain this twenty five to thirty percent cross domestic savings per capita uh, as a percent of GDP, we should be able to get that five to 6% real GDP and then reforms plus you know, foreign capital should take it up. So we still believe that India has the potential to grow real GDP at about between six and six and a half percent. We have to get many things right, uh, but we don't have to do something very extraordinary. It's like very, you know, even if we continue on our basic reform path that we've seen, we, are, we should be able to do. The only caveat is job creation. Uh, if, are, if India is not able to create the jobs for this young population, then we will have a social problem, which could be a religious, political, social problem. And that has a that will have a sure short cap on what the potential GDP growth is. Good. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, and Professor Panik? So let me take on the question that Arjun was asking, you know, about the China thing, you know. So what has happened is uh, post-COVID, China was hit by double whammy in, in a sense that first they were following what we call the zero COVID policy, which means they were shutting down everything. So China being the factory of the world, the first thing which happened was the disruption in the manufacturing sector. Now, another thing which has happened, which is not being talked about that much, which has to do with their construction sector. Now, because of, again, all the workers going back to their native places and China going to full shutdown, the construction sector got hit, which got a spillover effect on the financial sector. Now, if you go to the province of Henan and some other, uh, other uh, province in China, uh, you will find that the people who have put their money in banks, they are not able to uh, withdraw the money because uh, they have frozen the bank account. Uh, also, this Evergrande, the largest uh, construction company, as of today, they still owe close to 300 billion US dollar. You know, so uh, China, in a way, is uh, in a big trouble. Um, so uh, I, I, I hope that that spillover effect does not affect uh, because China is again one of our largest trading partners. Right? So that is something uh, I'd be cautious, uh, cautious about because. Uh, uh, again, something what uh, Deepak and others have mentioned, uh, we run a huge trade deficit with China. You know, that has to do with our, uh, because we are, when we are doing lots of intra-industry trade, in particular uh, with respect to the pharmaceutical industry, we found that the value of our uh, export is far less than the value of our import, which means that in terms of the quality of our product, which we are producing, they are not of great quality. So, uh, so I, I think the, Two things we should be uh, worried about is how to increase our competitiveness, be it in manufacturing or agriculture. And the second thing is how to ensure that if something happened uh, in terms of financial crisis in China, how we uh, take care of that. Good. Those are excellent comments. Thank you. So, Deepak, if you'd like to give us your comments as a closing before I wrap up and hand over to the organizers for their thanks. Uh, um, the high network as well as well as Omicron question. Yeah, I think all the questions were answered. So I, I I think very quickly, I think on the high network individual exodus from India, 
I'm, I, you know, I've read this, I've heard this, but I'm not sure whether these are official statistics and how reliable these are, and whether this is kind of a, there's a you know, sharp change over time. I do hear this, you know, fear in the industry um, and all sorts of things, but I will not be able to comment because frankly, I haven't done it and I don't know how robust those numbers are. On the decoupling, which you know, the China monetary policy decoupling in the rest of the world, you know, people make a big deal about it, but I think it's actually a net positive for the world economy because, you know, if the West tightens uh, and tightens dramatically while China accommodates, it's actually going to offset each other, and so it would be net uh, positive for the world then if China also tightens at the same time. And I think one of the things that has happened in the world is we have all got so synchronous uh, in our business cycle or macro policies in the world that you know the world falls and you know comes down at the same time so if there's a deep, bit of a decoupling not from a strategic point of view but because china is slowing down they have a lot of um, scope for fiscal stimulus you know they can put the bazooka into a chart and i think so i don't see that to be a big uh, Worry, except that people say that the decoupling between the two largest trading you know, nation in the world might have some unintended consequences that I don't know. But finally, just to end my presentation, and I, you know, it was wonderful to have this very nice discussion. I think the QA was better than the presentation we had. So thank you very much. I think, uh, despite what I might have appeared from my cautious optimism, as you said, I do feel like I'm a realist. I think I do. Um, feel that in the current context, you know, given India's very complicated politics, economy, and societal issues, uh, it's very hard for India to sustain, you know, 8% growth for a long period of time. But also given the gravity of the growth, we can't go below five. So I always feel myself that we are a 6.6.5% country for the long term. That's how I'll end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deepak. That was an excellent uh, discussion, I think. To tie your question, high net worth individuals will have to wait for a later time. I can speak right. from one, one low net worth individual who left the country. I'm sorry, I can't give any insight on that. So let me now uh, turn it over to to the organizers for their final comment. Arjun? Sir, would you like to wrap up with your concluding remarks? Do you mind? Yeah, sure. I was just looking at the time. You know, I think several things came out of this discussion that were pretty unique and insightful. I particularly enjoyed the juxtaposition of the uh, the market issues that Arvind brought out, the structural issues that Puja brought out, Deepak's uh, encompassing view with a lot of insight and data, and uh, Nilanjan, of course, coming from his perspective, uh, many of which I share. I found that really, really interesting. So. So I think a lot to be gained. I hope this uh, recording will be widely disseminated. Let me thank you, Arjun, again for uh, for organizing this. Okay, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, to all the panelists and our speaker. And thank you, sir, for chairing the session. So to quickly give our official vote of thanks, now I hand over to Tirta. Over to you, Tirta. Thank you, sir. So as we come to an end of this extremely enlightening discussion, I, Tripta, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the IMPRI Center for the Study of Finance and Economics, CSFE. We'd like to express our gratitude to the speaker for today's session, Professor Deepak Mishra, for taking out his precious time to share his views on the crucial topic, India's macroeconomic resilience amidst global fragility, facts, factors, and forecasts. We thank our esteemed discussants, Professor Nilanjan Banik, Dr. Pooja Misra, Mr. Arvind Chari, for adding your diverse perspectives and valuable insights to the deliberation. We are also grateful to Professor Rafiq Dosani for chairing and leading the talk. And of course, we thank all of our participants here on Zoom and on Facebook Live for participating and raising pertinent questions. We are grateful if you are watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications. I hope that you continue to tune in 
to the future, uh, tune in in the future to our State of the Economy series and IMPRI web policy talks. Thank you once again, and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice day.